We are created in the image of God, which part of this was covered last week, uh, but we're sliding into this week and we're looking at Adam. Adam has been created and then Eve is coming along and we're looking at Genesis beginning at chapter 2 verse 15. So I'm not going to read all of this and each week as we go forward, which is why I'm asking you all to read it because I'm going to pick pieces of it that I think Uh, I have some insight or I found somebody that has insight or maybe there are some questions or some confusion or things that I think are good and educational. You know, and, you know, playing off of Gail's point with the energetic part so you could stay awake during the sermon, as I'm going through this, if you were here last week, you know this, it's more of a classroom type of setting where it's like teacher and students. It's not, you're not going to probably hear a lot of really interesting stories from me. We're looking at the scripture. So, you are sitting there as a seminary student, and some of you might find this horrible, like boring, disinteresting, but try to pay attention and listen and learn, and if you can't focus on what I'm saying, uh, you know, open your Bible and start reading it or something, Um, but I understand how it is when you come in here. So let's dig right in to Genesis 2.15. Now think about that, Genesis chapter 2 This is the second chapter of the entire Bible. There are over 1,100 chapters in here. This is important stuff. What we talked about last week in chapter 1 and the first half of chapter 2. This is incredible because it goes back to the very beginning. It, It begins, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we're not much beyond that. And God wanted to create people in his image so he could have a relationship with us. Like, think about that. We struggle with relationships, right? Could you imagine being God, completely holy, knowing everything? Like, God knows everything you ever did, and he knows what you will do. (sighs) My goodness. Like, if you have kids, you understand the struggle a little bit, maybe. But God God loves us, as we sang about. So Genesis 2.15, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. So this Garden of Eden, I have this preconceived idea of what the Garden of Eden is like. It is a paradise. To me, it's like I'm on vacation and like on a cruise ship. I was never on a cruise ship, but uh, if you're on one, I imagine like if you want an iced tea, just tell somebody to get it for you. Like it's this paradise vacation where like it's everything is about you. It's kind of like you're a cat, honestly, like everybody's doing everything for you and you're doing nothing, right? Uh, But that's not what the Bible shows us. Now, it is a paradise. Eden in Aramaic means garden of abundance or something close to that. And the meaning of the Hebrew term Eden is luxury or delight, like a luxury liner. Like, do you remember the show The Love Boat? It's like you're on the love boat and everybody's meeting your needs. A a side note, I was at a family wedding the one time and one of the cast members, I think it was the doctor, he was at that wedding. Yeah, like you care. So... (laughs) But here's the thing, when we look at this scripture, look what it says at the end. God put man there to work it and to care for it. So, like, this blows my Charlie thinking about what the Garden of Eden is right out of the water. Now I'm working. Like, I have a garden. It's work. I'm out there pulling weeds and swatting at gnats and, you know, trying to get the water right and collect water and all that. It's, it's work. But it's a pleasure. Because this is what God created us for. In fact, I think in the Garden of Eden, the gnats won't be swarming around my head and I won't be hearing mosquitoes in my ears, but there's still work to do. What exactly that work is, I don't know, but I know this, if you walk up to an apple tree and you want to eat an apple from it, you got to pick an apple off, right? It's work. That's not much work, but it's still work. Somebody has to harvest. So God created us to serve Him, to obey Him, and to serve him. And it's right here in chapter 2. And if we could just follow through with that, we would be really well off. You were created to serve, to serve God, but also to serve other people. Now, if you're a Christian that is just, you know, I go to church Sundays and it's good, I hear a message and I get some coffee and, you know, whatever, and you're not serving other people, your theology stinks and it's off the mark throughout the whole Bible. Now, we find this in chapter 2. If you examine the life of Jesus, what did Jesus say about himself? I came to serve. If Jesus came to serve, 
and we see that man was put in the garden to serve God, what should we be focusing on? Obedience to God and serving other people. And you, know, you might have the question, well, how do I serve? Who do I serve? And that will take some work that I'm not prepared to preach about in this service. Uh, but in the future, I think in August or September, there will be a service devoted to that. So pretty good stuff here. But let's continue reading Genesis 2, 16, 17. God says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Now notice the term I highlighted. I don't know if you can tell I highlighted that, the word free. There are some Christians that believe that God controls everything. Everything is predetermined. Everything is predestined. In fact, before you were born, God decided if you would spend an eternity with him by being saved or not. Some Christians believe that everything is controlled. God knew what you were going to eat for breakfast. God knew that you would be in church today. God knows what you're going to do when you leave here because he predestined it. You have no choice in the matter. Now, we don't believe that in the churches of God and myself. There's a lot of evidence biblically to support free will. There's a fair amount of evidence to support that other opinion too, that God controls everything. But right here in chapter 2, we see God says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. You have your choice. It's like, like a Chinese buffet, but better. Oh man, I, how I miss Chinese buffets. Whew. Anyway, <laughs> so God says, eat from any tree in the garden that you want. But he didn't finish there. He also gave us a command with this free choice. And this gets to obedience, to obeying God. He says, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So God gave us one command. Like we talk about the Ten Commandments, right? It was originally one command. Oh, you think one person or two people could keep one command, wouldn't you? Like we can't even keep the Ten Commandments. Fortunately for us, since we can't keep any commandments, Jesus came to make us right. It, you know, all the music that points to Jesus that we were just singing, Man, that is our priority, Jesus. And there's something about the name of Jesus that has this special hierarchy in all of humanity. The name of Jesus. There is only one name through which you are saved. It is Jesus. You know, I might be your pastor. I will let you down. I will fail you. I will disappoint you. That's a guarantee. But you will let me down, disappoint me, and you will fail me if I give you the opportunity. Because we are humans. We are fallible. Jesus is the one who did not sin, who will not let us down. And notice this command. It's, it's a promise, and unfortunately it's a prophecy also, that, notice it says, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God knows what we will do, even though we're given free will. And he made a plan since before the creation of mankind for our reconciliation, knowing that we would fall, knowing that we would fail. So, did Adam and Eve die because they ate the forbidden fruit, which is disobeying God? Some people say the forbidden fruit was an apple. Well, that's the visual we use. As you know, my opinion is it was an onion. That's why they're so god-awful. Anyway, did they die? Well, they died spiritually because this separated them from a holy God. God, who is completely holy, cannot coexist where sin is existing. God is holy. God is pure. God, God is light. So he died spiritually. But in Genesis 5, 5, it says, Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years. And then he died. Before man sinned, we were created to be eternal beings. To be with God. To have that relationship with him. That perfect relationship. There was no death. And someday we will reach a point where there is, again, no more death, no pain, no sorrow, no suffering. But that's, you know, off in the future for us. Now, it doesn't tell us about Eve when she died, but we can be pretty confident that she did die because we saw that prophecy, that promise from God. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman... Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now notice what Satan's doing there. Satan is a deceiver and he knows the holes and the flaws and you know 
the, how we tend to think about things, he doesn't even say, he doesn't even give an accurate statement because he is a liar and he is a deceiver. He gives you a partial truth. Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You know that. God didn't say that. And Satan is using this to get Eve's attention and he's just throwing down the breadcrumbs and leading her exactly where he wants her to go. Now, we have to be careful of this because Satan is so clever and crafty. In fact, if you look at the top, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. But let's get down to verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, You may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, did I read that right? We may eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. What Satan did was tempt Eve. Look, this is the fruit that's in the middle of the garden. You can eat it. Look, it's beautiful. It's good you know, to look at. It's good to eat. It'll nourish you. It'll give you wisdom and knowledge. Oh boy, it gave them wisdom. It gave, us wis- it gave us the knowledge of evil is what it did. Satan is the great tempter and he's the great deceiver. Satan tempted Moses. Mur- Moses murdered a man. Satan tempted David. He committed adultery. Satan tempted Solomon and beca- he became self-centered. He surrounded himself with all the materialistic things he could ever want. Ah, he had such wealth. Satan tempted Jesus. Jesus quoted scripture. Now you know that the story of the temptation of Jesus in the desert? Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He was at a weakened state. Like if he was ever going to fail, this is where it was going to be. He was weak. He was hungry. He was thirsty. And Satan comes and he makes him these promises. If you will just do this, you, the whole world will be yours. If you will just bow down and worship me. If you will just you know, throw yourself off of this temple. And to every one of Satan's temptations, Jesus quoted Scripture. He quoted the Word of God. Now, if you don't know the Word of God, you can't use this as your defense. Which is why, read the Word of God. Jesus was perfect. But understand this, Satan has and Satan will tempt you. And when you have fallen down and when you have failed and when you have, you know, Listen to Satan too much. Understand this. Moses, David, Solomon, all of the biblical greats, except for Jesus himself, fell for the tricks and the lies of Satan. So don't beat yourself up too much, especially about what you did. You know, I did a lot of dumb things in my life, but I know this at my ripe old age now, a lot of those things I won't do again. And I'm more wise to Satan's temptations. Will I still sin? Yeah, of course I will, because I'm still human. But you know what? I know Satan's tactics, and I know that he knows my weaknesses, so I need to be aware of my weaknesses. Where is Satan going to tempt me? Well, there are certain areas he will tempt me. They're probably not the same areas he will tempt you. Now, they might be, but they might not be. Satan knows how he can get you to trip and fall. And he also knows this, how you will react to it. Could you imagine if you were Eve and you ate the forbidden fruit and sinned and you're kicked out of the garden? Like for a lot of people, and I could tell you this, I've seen this happen with people. People will respond by saying something like, why do I even try? I'm not good enough. You know, I fell for it. I turned, I ruined the whole thing. In churches, this happens. Why do I even try? That's what Satan wants you to believe. That you're not good enough. That you have failed. That somebody else has higher expectations than you can meet. You know, the danger for a church, the danger for this church, since we're a church, is not that we will fail, but that we will succeed doing things that don't matter. You've probably seen it happen in churches. You may have seen it happen in this church. And this is where the leadership, we have our meetings Monday, you know, I see Kay Pickle, she's an elder. You know, the leaders of this church, in fact, everybody in this church, needs to keep us focused on what really matters. And I know, I'm part of that. If we start chasing after rainbows, looking for the gold that's buried, you know, we are wasting our time. We need to focus on what honestly and truly matters to God. 
Does God care what color our carpets are? And we, this isn't something we've fought about ever that I know of. No, God doesn't care what color the carpets are. And we can argue and fight and become divided over an issue like that. But we can't. We can't. Or we are following the tail of Satan. We need to follow right behind Jesus and do things that truly matter. And if we're not doing things that truly matter to God, we have failed. But it may look like success to us. Yeah, let's move on. God spoke to the serpent in Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Again, this is one of those, like when you go to seminary, this is a verse that you really look at and you really have to grasp. In fact, you're all, you're all sitting there reading it again, except Becky Brown was taking a drink of her whiskey, I think. But, uh, or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, Becky. Uh, <laughs> so what I get here, you know I struggle with English, and then God throws a word like enmity at me. Have you ever said that out loud, enmity? It's, it's a terrible word. Like, the N and M should be reversed, at least make it enmity. That's easier to say. I, who knows what enmity means if, if you don't read the screen? How many of you ever use that in your daily conversation? You know, I, I can't say I ever do because I could barely say the darn word to begin with. But enmity means hatred or hostility is probably a better definition. So God will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Now he's talking to Satan. Uh, so who are the woman's offspring? Now we're talking about Eve. Well, her offspring obviously is people. She is the mother of all people, right? From Adam and Eve came all people. We are all brothers and sisters or ancestors of some type because we can all trace ourselves back to Adam and Eve. So we're all related. So it's fair to say, hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, anyway. Um, but also her offspring includes Jesus. Jesus was born of a woman. If you look in Luke, I think it's chapter 2, it could be chapter 3, I should look up that. Anyway, if you look in Luke at the genealogy, it goes from Jesus to Adam. So you go from Adam all the way down through until there's Jesus. So that's, that's really what this is referring to, Jesus being the offspring. Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, which is kind of a, a, an awkward term, I always felt. He's the son of God, right? No, nobody denies that, but he referred to himself, in most cases, as the son of man. Uh, so Jesus is also the offspring of the woman. But who is the serpent's offspring? Like when you read this, do you ever think about that stuff? And that's why I want to encourage you, like slow down and process the words, what it's actually saying. Because things like that will pop out. Like who is Satan's offspring? And you know, I'm sitting at home on Tuesday asking myself this question as I'm preparing this message. Well, who is Satan's offspring? And I gave it a little bit of thought and I thought, well, it would be demons, right? Well, that's my answer, but Bible experts, theologians, Commentary writers don't seem to fall in line with my thinking, so I'm probably wrong. You don't hear me say that very often, but they might be right. They say something like sin is Satan's offspring. Of course, the offspring of Eve is Jesus. Jesus will kill sin by overcoming sin himself. Uh, so sin is the offspring of... I don't see that as like offspring, but I understand the Bible doesn't always speak in words like I would. Uh, thank God. Uh, but the third one, sinful men who reject Jesus. Some theologians say this is referring to Satan's offspring are people who completely reject Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, the Son of God, and Savior of the world. Now, here's where I struggle with this one. Is I have known people, I have seen people who have been completely opposed to God and have rejected Jesus and then change their ways. Somehow they hear the gospel message and they believe it. So biblically, if you look at Saul, who became the apostle Paul, he would be one of them. Right? He was trying to extinguish the church when it was brand new, going around, you know, 
watching Christians be killed, throwing them in jail, arresting them, dragging them away. That was Saul. And then he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and it completely changed him so much that he became the greatest church planter and evangelist in the history of mankind, probably. So Jesus is, ref- or I think what they're referring is Jews who rejected Jesus especially. And there's an example biblically of this. So uh, let's take a look at that. If you want to fast forward to John chapter 8, beginning at verse 40. Now Jesus is talking to some religious leaders. I think they were the Pharisees, um, Jewish men, Jewish religious leaders. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. That's Jesus speaking. And they respond, we are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you were unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, and there is no truth in him. Now, what's troubling about this, these are Jewish religious leaders who know the Old Testament, and they don't recognize the promised Messiah that they had been waiting for and waiting for And because they are rejecting Jesus Christ as the Messiah, Jesus says this about them. You are serving your father, the devil, that great serpent from ancient days. We have to be careful because I think today we would refer to people like that as wolves in sheep's clothing. You will see preachers like that. You will even see congregations like that that aren't committed to Jesus Christ they're committed to something else. You know, I take, I don't want to say great pride, but I am so pleased that in the churches of God and in this congregation, we are focused on Jesus Christ. He is our priority, and he has to stay our priority. Some other congregations and denominations are focused on lesser things. Jesus is part of the mix, But some of them will say the most important thing is that you keep a Sabbath day holy or that you get baptized as a believer or that you fill in the blank. If it ain't Jesus, it ain't the gospel. Anyway. So how do we know that the serpent was Satan? Well, we believe in the churches of God that we should allow Scripture to interpret itself. We can have opinions, right? Like I gave you some of my opinions and like Eden, what I thought Eden should be. And then I look at the scripture, what it actually is. So what does the scripture say about something? We can have opinions. Some of them will be right. Some of them won't be right. So here we look at Revelation to get the answer to this question. Uh, Revelation 12, 9. The great dragon that was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray in Revelation 22 An angel sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So here we see the correlation. If we go back to the beginning of the Bible, what are we in Revelation or Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 3, and we see it right here, Revelation 12, Revelation chapter 20. So it's almost bookends to the Bible. We see this serpent, Satan being talked about. In Genesis 3.16, to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Now, obviously, I never gave birth to a child. But those of you who have, did it hurt? (laughs) Uh, My wife's going to throw something at me. Um, Yeah, there's pain involved, and God told us that there would be pain involved. But women, take heart, because as difficult as as giving birth is, us men have it far worse based on what the Bible says. We have to be picking vegetables, and there will be thorns and thistles and things like that to deal with too. So there's pain. But on a serious note, 
life comes with pain. Whether it's childbirth, giving birth is painful. Think about Jesus' crucifixion and why that was necessary. The only way that we could have life, true life, beyond this life, is by Jesus going to the cross and being raised from the dead. Man, the pain that he must have felt on the cross was probably excruciating. You know, to me, one of the worst feelings in the world is when you can't breathe. And that's what crucifixion does. It suffocates you. And there's a lot of pain beyond that too, but think about that. The pain that was involved so we could have life. But think about this also. Think about your surrender to Christ. If there is no pain involved, you need to really look at your salvation because there should be things you had to stop doing. There should be things that you had to start doing. There should be, in most cases, people that you had to walk away from. Habits you had to give up. You know, you probably chose to be baptized as a believer. You know, there is a cost, a real, intentional cost to salvation. And if you're questioning me on this, because I know some of you accepted Jesus when you were very little and you may not realize the cost, look at Scripture. Look at Jesus and people he talked to about following him. When he walked up to people, think about your job, those of you that work. Jesus would walk up to somebody while they're at their desk working. Matthew, the tax collector, say, come and follow me. He's saying, quit your job, leave everything behind, and follow me. Think about the rich young ruler we talked about a couple weeks ago. Jesus said, go and sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And we see example after example after example in the New Testament of the cost of people who chose to follow Jesus. If you have no cost, really take a good look at your faith and ask yourself, have I surrendered my will and my life to Jesus? Because this is discipleship. You know, uh, today is going to be the first day of youth camp up at Camp Uligua. So 220 plus teenagers (laughs) going to be up at camp. (laughs) Pray for them. Pray for the counselors up there and the students. Some of them will probably say a prayer, giving their life to Christ. Now, praise God for that. But the cost is more than that. It's not just bow your head, say this prayer, and raise your hand if you said the prayer. Now I'm saved. I'm good to go. Now I can go back and do everything I was doing before I left home. No, it's a life change. You know, Jesus said, grab the plow and plow straight ahead. Because if you look back, Meaning, if you want to cling to your former life, you're not going to be plowing a straight line. You're going to be waving all over the place. And that's not what God's plan is for your life. Ah, So here's a question that we might run into today in our culture. Uh, Is marriage between one man and one woman, biblically? And I specifically put the words one in there because that, that's a kind of a different debate than your initial reaction would be to this. Um, so there's a pretty simple answer to this. The answer would be yeah. Biblically, marriage is between one man and one woman. Now our culture of course accepts other things. So one of them would be polygamy. In fact, there are some religious groups that believe that a man could have multiple wives. And they will point to things like Solomon had, what, like a thousand wives? He was wise, right? Man of God. And stuff like that. In Old Testament, we find polygamy. Does that make it right? If we look at God's plan, it really seems like it was meant to be one man, one woman. And we look back at Adam and Eve. What does it say? A man should leave his mother and father and be united to his wife. It doesn't say wives, one man, one woman. So, is marriage in the Bible? Well, in Genesis 2, let me read this to you. So, the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Adam, in chapter 3, verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Now, I looked, I have, I think it's called an interlinear Bible where it shows you the original language, the Hebrew, and the the English translation. And I looked in maybe five or six different English translations that I trust for accuracy. Every single source I looked at had the word wife, which tells me one man, one woman being married is God's plan. If you look at the nuclear family, right, should be a husband, wife, and if they have kids, kids. This is God's plan. And we have this, especially in the United States, compared to some other countries, we have this all messed up. And if you are feeling convicted, maybe you're on your second marriage, or maybe you have two wives, or, well, any of you have two wives currently? Okay, good. Let's avoid that discussion entirely. But Wednesday from 3 to 8, I am available for counseling. Like I could fill out a whole slot. Ah. So we see this example. And could you imagine what our society would look like if we kept this? If the nuclear family was normal and to be expected. Man and woman marry, have kids, raise their kids to repeat the process. That was God's plan, and we had this so messed up. Now, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not trying to make you guilty about your past. You can't change that. So what I want you to work on, whatever your situation right now, work on your situation right now and going forward. You know, if you've been married five times, you know, Jesus talked to the woman at the well, right? She was married five times, and he made her an evangelist. Whoo! Boom, there goes my theology right out the window. God cares about who you are now and who you are going forward. You can't change the past. Let it pass and be the most godly person you can be. And if you're married, you know, marriage, God intended husband and wife to be a spiritually and physically united. Who wrote that? To be spiritually and physically united, walking in integrity serving God, and keeping His commands together. When this is prevalent in our society, there is peace, prosperity, harmony, and goodwill. Man, this should be the blueprint for mankind because it was given to us in Genesis. Chapter 3, I think. So, let me just say, you know, don't feel guilty about what you did yesterday or what you did 10 years ago or the mistakes you made, the blah, blah, blah. Be the best godly man and the best godly woman you can be. Whether you're married, single, you know, divorced, separated, remarried, wherever you are at right now, from this moment going forward, commit yourself to God. Surrender your will to Jesus and God will be pleased with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, boy, words are easy to say. Living them is so difficult. To be a godly husband, to be a godly wife is hard. We like different things. We do things differently, and then we change. But Lord, it is your plan. You created Adam, and you created Eve. One boy, one girl. And you wanted them to live in harmony. And next week we see how they did at parenting. God, we need your help. (laughs) Uh, You are an awesome God. And the one consistent thing we have that does not change is you. We thank you that you allow us to have a relationship with you. Lord, help everybody that is within the sound of my voice, both physically or online, to be committed to studying your word, to doing the reading, and to spending even more time in prayer, talking with you and listening for your voice. In Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. So all of you, go, lead somebody to Christ this week. If you can, behave like Christ is living in you. Let people see it, and it may earn you the right to speak words, words of life into their life. Now go in peace with the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.